Welcome to Gaius Everything, the podcast ranging in subjects from sex to astrophysics. Today I just came home from Tromsø, which could be said to be the capital of the northern part of Norway. It's above the Arctic Circle, which means in the winter you will have two months of darkness, and in the summer you will have two months where the sun doesn't set. You will see the midnight sun, and in the middle of the night you can see people mowing the lawn, etc. It is a nice city with a fantastic surrounding nature. And this year, the WISTA annual conference, uh, WISTA being the Women's International Shipping and Trading Association, was held in Tromsø. And they had three days of uh, a conference. And at the last day today were the workshops. And there were parallel workshops, uh, several of them. And uh, all the other workshops have several speakers within a three Uh, our time slot. Uh, on my workshop it was only me, so I had uh, 25 ladies uh, and had fun and, uh, and, and a great time with them for three hours. Uh, the topic of my workshop was digitization, robots and AI, why women will be the last to be replaced by robots and artificial intelligence. And keeping to the To the tradition of these uh, podcasts, I will go straight to the point and summarize rather than keep you awake for three hours going through the same things I did with these ladies. Uh, there is a, a blog post accompanying this uh, podcast. It is at uh, isna.org as usual. And you will find it if you search. And if you're uh, quick on your feet, you will see it as the top blog post on my site. Uh, basically, I covered that automation since 7050 has uh, mainly hit male op occupations. While it's true that uh, automation also hit early on some female occupations like sewing and making clothes, etc., traditional female occupations, it has more heavily uh, encroached on uh, the male occupations, the heavy lifting, the industrial revolution, the, the factories, uh, all the manual work, has been uh, subject to a lot of automation up through the years. And uh, moving uh, straight on up to the 20th century, number crunching was also automated through the 50s, 60s and 70s, uh, bringing uh, in view my, my passion for collecting old Hewlett Packard calculators from the 60s, 70s and 80s. So number crunching has been subject to automation and the military has been very much subject to automation. And obviously, uh, later on, also a lot of other technology has uh, been automated. Uh, anything from software testing to all kinds of uh, nanotechnology, etc. And uh, also business decisions have been automated, or partly automated. And now you can also see initiatives where law uh, has been automated to the point that actually today, uh, two stories broke on artificial intelligence. Uh, on, um, on Slashdot, you could read about the, the artificial intelligence drawing that was uh, auctioned off uh, on, at Christie's, where they thought maybe this artificial uh, artwork uh, should go for some, somewhere between $7,000 and $10,000, but it ended up in a bidding war where uh, the winner actually paid... Uh, $432,500. And it is uh, a canvas titled Edmond de Bellamy from La Famille de Bellamy. And uh, it depicts a blurred and unfinished image of a man. So uh, that's the first artificial intelligence artwork that has gone through a major house for auction. And also today, We can read about an interesting story. Let me find it here. Yeah, this is all on Slashdot. Slashdot.org. It's a major tech site. So if you're a techie or a geek, you should follow Slashdot. It's a news aggregator. Uh, it reads, and I read aloud here. In a landmark study, 20 
top U.S. corporate lawyers with decades of experience in corporate law and contract review were pitted against an artificial intelligence. Their task was to spot issues in five non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, which are a contractual basis for most business deals. The study carried out with leading legal academics and experts saw the law geeks AI, artificial intelligence, achieve an average 94% accuracy rate higher than the lawyers who achieved an average rate of 85%, meaning 9 percentage points higher. It took the lawyers an average of 92 minutes to complete the NDA issue spotting compared to 26 seconds for the law geek AI. The longest time taken by a lawyer to complete the test was 156 minutes and the shortest time was 51 minutes. So not only does the AI beat the lawyers in time, hands down, it also beats it on quality. And this is interesting stuff. So even law is now being uh, subject to automation. And then of course we have the gaming uh, industry, the serious gaming industry if you will, uh, where Deep Blue, the IBM uh, chess computer, beat uh, the chess master back in, uh, back in uh, the 90s, but now we also see Alpha Zero, uh, which beat uh, Stockfish. Stockfish being the, one of the main um, uh, chess game, uh, autom- automated chess game uh, playing uh, software. Uh, it, it is uh, incorporating all the bright minds in the world with all the opening moves and the mid game and the end game and all the, you know, the, the human experience has been packed into Stockfish. Uh, so there's a lot of programming and this is an open source uh, project that has been, uh, you know, a lot of people has contributed to this uh, project called Stockfish. Then came Alpha Zero. Alpha Zero is based on AlphaGo, which is a famous artificial intelligence that beat the most uh, proficient Go player. Go is one of the most complex strategic games. It's very simple. It's just uh, black and, and white pieces on the board, but, but the, the, the way it's played is extremely complicated. And um, AlphaGo beat the best Go player in the world, and therefore they used some of that to, to see if they can uh, beat uh, uh, the best chess playing engine, Stockfish. And what they did was uh, Google, which made this, uh, just gave AlphaZero uh, the rules of the chess game and then let AlphaZero play against itself millions or billions of times uh, for, for maybe 16 hours, I think, and then it was just out of you know trial and error against itself. It was then pitted against um, uh, Stockfish for 100 games, and it beat it uh, 28 times out of 100. But also then had the rest of the games where a draw. It never lost. And this is an amazing feat because there is no human knowledge put in there, it's just the rules of the game, the basic rules of the game. And Alpha Zero cracked the codes and did stuff that Stockfish would never compete with, could never compete with. So so we are talking about an extreme level of automation that is hitting uh, the world from all sides now. And if you look at this track record, Industrial revolution, a lot of manual work, number crunching, the military technology, business decisions, law, and then the game chess and go. Most of these are male dominated occupations. And the, uh, the automation itself is driven by ma- men. So men are automating their own sphere, basically running themselves out of business, so to speak. Uh, now, uh, my subject of this uh, workshop today is why women will be the last in shipping to be replaced by robots and AI. And it might be obvious uh, when, when I say this, it's because of the empathy and the creativity and the human factors involved. Because if you have um, uh, any, any process which has a set fixed uh, input, then you can automate that input into a fixed output. Think about the Toyota production system. Think about glass, aluminium, steel, rubber going in on one side, and then a fixed process creating a car. Now that that, that can be done, right? Uh, 
Um, but if you have unknown inputs, there is uh, whatever coming in on the side. It's not just not uh, steel and, and glass and, and stuff that you make a car with. But, but if you have unknown inputs, then you cannot have a fixed process creating a fixed result. You can either have a fixed process, but that will then end up in an uncertain or undecided result. But if you want a fixed result, you want you must have a flexible process if you have unknown input. This is covered in my earlier article called Processes, Automation and Human Potential, which is linked in this blog post accompanying this, uh, this podcast. So you can go there and you can find this article. And there's also in there a mathematical model on how you determine if something is worth automating or not. So it's a, it's a, yeah, my interest for mathematics shines through in this article also. But I also talk there about responsibility and why it's sometimes uh, there are stuff that you don't want to automate, specifically where you have, uh, have to do with a great deal of empathy, where there is unknown input, where you have ethics involved, where you have creativity involved, and obviously where you have free will involved. Because, and this boils down to this, my, my, um, my passion for free will, if you like, it boils down to this. If people, if you and I, do not possess even the possibility of free will, then there is no difference between us and artificial intelligence. Then there cannot be a difference. Uh, then we're all subject to physics and uh, find there is, uh, we, can, we can automate ourselves out of existence. Now, if we do have, if we can possess, if there is a possibility that we can possess free will, there is, therein lies the difference between artificial intelligence and intelligence. And in this free will also lies the, the possibility of empathy, real true empathy and creativity, creating something which is not pre-programmed. Free will I would define as uh, a decision that is not um, uh, relying on past, present or future conditions. So most decisions are obviously, I talked about this uh, on another podcast regarding free will, but if there is a possibility, even the smallest possibility that you can freely choose, then you can possess free will. And that makes you different from artificial intelligence. Now let's pretend I'm right in that free will can exist. Then there are certain areas where you cannot automate, you cannot let artificial intelligence encroach completely on human uh, endeavor because it cannot possess free will. Now, while automation also hits female occupations, it predominantly hits male occupations. And I think also in the shipping industry, you will have automated almost everything. You will automate car uh, cargo, you will automate uh, all kinds of stuff with birthing. You will, you will automate um, uh, parts and, and uh, the, the whole cycle of how a ship goes. And you will ultimately also have automated ships. And this is a big thing in shipping. You talk about, oh, autonomous ships, is that coming or not? And when is it coming, etc. If we extrapolate a thousand years into the future, it is very hard to envision that there wouldn't be fully automated ships. Uh, maybe not in the next 10, 50 or 100 years even, but sometimes in the future within a thousand years, I'm dead certain that automated ships is coming. But what you will not automate away is the human interaction, the empathy, the soft parts of being a human, which female, uh, females, women, have predominantly uh, been better at. They are better trained, they are more focused on the softer part, which is why they often gravitate towards HR jobs, human resource jobs, and which is why they often are better managers, actually, per survey and per statistics. So it's harder to automate the empathy-related work because there is unknown input. And the most famous unknown input to any process is people. So people are uh, unpredictable. Uh, they cannot be broken down into... Uh, you have sciences going and trying to depict how people are, etc. And you will, you will have all kinds of trying to automate recruitment processes, which I took up in this workshop today also, that when I was uh, heading a recruitment company from 1990 to 2000, I was a firm believer that you could automate everything. You can automate 
anything. And I try to automate and processize this recruitment process and fine tune it and whatnot. And before we reached the success rate of 97.4% of the right person in the right place, the previous world record was said to be PA Consulting Group in the 1980s, which had about 80% success rate. We reached 97.4%, which is uh, due to extensive testing, not only personality tests and IQ tests and that kind of test, but also on the job testing, testing people and lots of interviews and reference checking and everything. We, we fine tuned this almost like the Toyota production system. And the way we measured it was completely in the hands of the customer because 18 months after we, we did the placement, uh, we sent out a survey with only two boxes that they could uh, put a mark in. And that was, was this the right person in the right place? Yes or no? So it was based on the customer's yes or no. So 97.4% yes. Now, I am certain we failed. I am certain we fucked up. Not on the actual process, not on the uh, asking the customer, and not on the 97.4%. But I'm dead certain we missed some geniuses. People that would be fantastic employees. We, we did good employers, you know, employees or placement. We did, you know, the right person in the right place. But we might not have gotten the fantastic people in the right place. And there is no way to measure that. Because an, an artificial intelligence will try to automate and make the best choice. But will it really make the brilliant choice? And I'm certain we did not achieve that in our recruitment company. And I'm certain that AI will also walk straight into the same trap. It will make a you know, really good statistical choice. But will it make a brilliant choice? And that's where I think... It will fail. Not in chess, because that's a limited game. It has a, a set and fixed in, input. You know all the pieces. You know the rules of the game. There is no unknown variables into the game. But in the game of life, it is. This is why chess cannot be compared to war on the battlefield, because you have people, they desert, they do all kinds of crazy shit, whereas the pieces on the chessboard, they do not possess free will. If you put a peasant there, it will be taken by the queen, and the peasant will not object. So, more about this in my article, Processes, Automation, and Human Potential, and you should read that and give me some feedback on that if you like. I wrote that back in 2012, and uh, this was now just brought up because of this workshop I did today. Something in the workshop that, that struck me, because I usually don't do slides. Uh, I usually just draw and I jump around and I use people and, and uh, stuff to, to show, uh, you know, I've used tables and chairs and stuff, and, and not slides. And this time I actually did do slides. And I really think that was uh, a failure. I think I failed on that because uh, the slides didn't work. Not at all. It, it was, uh, no, that was a mess. So going back to no slides guide is, is what's going to happen from now. Even though I spent like, I don't know, five, six hours creating the slides, that was... Back to basics, do not do slides guide, note to self. Um, I also brought up a couple of videos, which is linked on my uh, on my blog post regarding this uh, podcast. And what it, one is, it's not about the nail. And another one is Amnesty looking across borders, which is um, a few of those videos out there. And I picked the Icelandic one, where there is a Amnesty International in Iceland taking refugees and uh, an Icelandic uh, people and sitting them down for four minutes looking at each other and see what that does with empathy. And this plays straight into the one-page book that Brendan and I wrote, which is called Mental Training the Core, which has to do with drills regarding sitting down and looking at another person and the undercut just shutting your eyes and being mentally present. We did those two drills in the workshop today, which was, I think, a bit strange for the people that were there, because uh, why do we do this? Well, it is to train you to be completely present, which is a prerequisite for listening. And uh, by that, you can read the, the book, uh, Listening Superpower, uh, on why you should be able to listen. Well, it's about empathy. If you really hone your empathy, if you train your empathy, you will be even less uh, easy to automate away because the most empathetic people are the people for the future the people that can reach 
and get on the wavelengths of other people, those are the people that are going to be uh, the masters in the future, the, the good leaders, the, the people with creativity, the people that cannot be easily automated by robots or artificial intelligence. So we took this up to train the empathy and give them a little whiff for what training empathy actually is. Another one I took up was how to uh, become more, uh, even more empathetic, just not sitting there and looking at another person, but actually do something. And then I took up something which I have covered in a previous uh, podcast, which is how to effectively help another. Uh, and the way you help another is to help make that person help another person. So to be more empathetic, you should go out and start helping people. Then you starve your own problems to the point where uh, your own problems, they, they just die of starvation from, uh, from your own uh, lack of attention to them. So this is what I covered. It was uh, a real fun three uh, hours for me. And I, uh, I said to them that I will make, uh, not this blog, this podcast, because this is something I just decided to do on the airplane and uh, when, I, when I got home now. But I said I will do another blog, podcast which has to do with why you should collaborate more why you should do open source software development, why you should share data, why the shipping industry should be less, uh, you know, hell-bent on competitiveness and more coming together and, uh, and look at collaboration. I was um, at uh, the Shipping 2030 in Singapore a few weeks back and I said the only thing that will bring the shipping industry together uh, it's an alien invasion, just like planet Earth. The only way to bring uh, China and the and, uh, US and Russia and everybody together is if there was to be an alien invasion and everybody would be on the same page in the week and everybody would be one big world of human beings. Now, the same thing could be happening to the shipping industry if uh, some Google or Amazon uh, really came in and, and cleaned this industry and everybody would say, oh my God, there is the enemy, there's this an alien invasion and we should get together and cooperate rather than just uh, go competitive against each other. Now maybe that alien invasion is uh, more uh, women into the shipping industry because that's quite alien to the shipping industry. It's very, very conservative, very male dominated. It's the malest of the male industries. And it's dominated by elder men in suits and being dead conservative and resisting change like, like hell. And, and the women are struggling to cooperate more. And, uh, but some women are, uh, are, you know, aping after the men and trying to be men, which is not a good thing. They should be the women and they should be empathetic and should, they should try to change the business to the point where I see, you know, if shipping industry get more females, more women in uh, the decision uh, positions, then I will see the shipping industry doing more good than harm to the planet. Because I think the holistic view, not only the economic view, but the holistic view of how can we save the oceans, how can we do something good for this planet, relies on the shoulders of women, I think. So maybe in the future where uh, the males have, uh, the men have automated themselves out of the shipping industry and what is left is the empathetic women, we might see the, the association, Men's International Shipping and Trading Association, the MISTA, come up instead of the WISTA. Because the fact that we have a WISTA is it's in itself a sign of a disease of the, of the male industry, the maritime industry. So, uh, girl power, go, and uh, let's work for uh, Mista in the future. That's all for now. Thank you very much. Bye.